This is Mike and welcome to Real Black. We're in conversation today with Ian Edwards, one of the funniest, dry, driest comedians <laughs> on the planet. Um, people so have accused me of being low key, but I don't know what's what we're in for here. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. I'm good. Welcome back to Philly. Welcome back to the East Coast. I know I haven't been to Philly in, in a minute. It's been a long ass time, but it's You're good to be back. First time headlining at Helium or? First time here. Headline at Helium. I figure yeah, because know. we've had virtually every comic sit on this couch or be on the Helium stage, and I've, I've no, I know everybody. We're one degree of separation from mm -hmm. one another, but I've never seen you perform, and we've never met. So I'm so happy to uh, meet you and well, you find out. You just saw me perform. <laughs> I just saw you perform. Oh, oh, you don't want that out on the thing. Well, I'd never seen you perform Up before. Until, right, right. This is the precision. This man's a writer. Now, it, was, it was just funny because I saw you two, you and the camera guy, uh -huh. sitting in the audience. Yeah. And I just thought you were regular audience members. And then they said, all right, they, they, people are going to interview you from Real Black are here. And then um, the two audience members walk in with a camera and a oh, director. Okay. Yeah. True. I'm not sure why. This is the first time that they ever put us in the very front right. row for whatever reason. It was mm -hmm. very awkward for me as well. <laughs> I'm like, but it was interesting because I got to see you work up close. Right, and that, right. That's really what interests me the most. I mm -hmm. love talking to comedians and, and um, I'm just fascinated by the, the craft, the art of it. Right, right. And um, what interests me most about what you do is that um, you, you've you been doing stand-up forever, but you're you're three weeks bread and butter three weeks your bread and butter has uh -huh. been writing for so many of the shows that I, that we all love so, uh -huh. so um, you know can you speak to that like what's what's the difference between writing for yourself and writing for say blackish uh, well blackish is like pretty close to like real life there's stuff that we wrote about on blackish that a lot of black people or just people period just uh, scenarios and instances of life that happen to us really mm -hmm. and my stand-up is kind of like based on like real life as much as possible even if it's a new story it relates to how I think about it or if it's just something from my life like you heard some of the jokes today mm -hmm. you know about the first time how I lost my virginity and stuff that's all real right you know what I'm saying so like before I'm, I just had to learn how to write, period. Okay. So writing on the show, you're sitting there every day, and you're forced to learn to write. And the more you're forced to learn to write, the more you grow. So then at some point, at least for me, unless I'm on the wrong show, which never really happens, like I've just grown to be able to write for more things okay. as a person. And also I encounter other writers and I see how their mind works, and it also helps give my mind more information right. on how to write and how to expand and how to be better. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, so so take us back. I mean, how how did you break in to uh, comedy? And um, you have two lives. How did that start to take place or take shape? I didn't know stand up would lead to writing. I had no idea. I just just started doing stand up because people told me I was funny, so started going to the local open mics and uh, watching and then at some point I went on stage bombed real hard and then but one joke I was nervous the light was shining in my face I kind of froze I told people to come down and watch me which is like a mistake to, on your first time because now your friends are seeing you do a shitty job and you know it every second of the set Mm -hmm. Like they're watching you do bad. They're watching you stutter. They're watching you be nervous. They're watching you shake. And you're like, shit, this is not good. But then I pulled it together and the last joke worked. And I was like, and they laughed. And I was like, all right, I just got to get over this nervousness and I'll be fine. Like, mm -hmm. it's definitely a shy person, but was going to use this as a way n not, not to, I guess... That wasn't like the foremost thing on my, in my mind to like not be shy anymore, but to, it was, I, once I felt like I was gonna do comedy, mm -hmm. I had to learn how to get past the nerves. Well, I go on IMDb, your first 
writing credit is Uptown Comedy Club, which is like one of my holy grails. I get a whole complete season of that uh -huh. clean. I'd love it because I, I remember so many of the comedians uh -huh. from, from that, Maceo and uh, right. Derek Fo Wait, Was Derek Fox on Apollo or was he on? He was on. His Apollo Comedy Hour. Apollo. He, he, he might have He might have did both. Maceo, Perilla, yeah. Tracy Morgan. Right. I forget who the your woman was. Were you were you also a performer on that or just no writing? no no? I actually I performed that. I did stand up on it. That was my first TV stand up credit. Uptown Comedy Club. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, what are your thoughts of the earliest days of coming up in New York in that scene? Because it it seems like now we're in another resurgence of of uh, sort of a comedy boom, as as people are saying it. There's more outlets. There's more places to be seen and you have a brand new special but right. so what compare comparing then to now what, what's what are your memories or thoughts it's just a different time it was a lot of fun we were young and you were just doing stuff trying to figure out life and comedy and how to make both of them work without knowing anything hmm. about life or comedy or how to make it work so it's just like for me even though I was having a lot of fun, I was also in my head a lot trying to figure out things. And then I said this before, like, like I'm Jamaican, so I grew up in Jamaica. I was, came here when I was 17. So I also had to figure out, like, American black culture, because that, that's the closest set of, that's the closest uh, identity I could cling to, mm -hmm. besides being Jamaican and hanging out with Jamaican people. There's like way more American black people, so I'm just assimilating and trying to learn as much about American black culture so that I can also use that in my act. So it was just a whole learning experience and like going around with comics and, uh, and going to do shows and going to different parts of the country just taught me a lot, maybe even faster than if I had like a regular job and just stayed in one neighborhood and worked. I'm getting a sense of a certain road trip or something is sticking in your head specifically no no not at all just you just yeah. always on the road just just hitting different towns no i'm just, it's just we just did i just learned like the funny thing is you uh think you learn how to do comedy you think you're funny once you get your first five minutes mm -hmm. and then you're like all right damn i got my first five minutes i'm killing and then because you're killing and you got your first five ten minutes whatever people want to start taking you on the road. Mm. But then you go on the road and then you realize all your shit is just a local funny. Like there's, I did a show in Jamaica, in uh, Philly at Temple and I got booed because I started off with my Jamaican jokes mm. and they didn't have a lot of Jamaicans in Philly right. and no Jamaicans the way New York black people knew Jamaicans. And so everything was just lost. And I got booed off by the whole school. Right, so you had to learn that and find your own lane because you had... Well, I had to just expand my comedy horizons more, my writings, and be more relatable to everybody and not just to a New York crowd. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So when when does it... Or does it? I mean, there, I, you know, I'm just thinking about the time. There are a lot of people I know that were great stand-ups. Um, Hugh Moore, who's actually coming back yeah, to stand up now. What was your decision to make the transition more to, to getting writing credits as opposed to? Uh, I got one writing job from auditioning through stand up and the job was in LA. So then I went to LA and New York was just a grind at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's like you, like people are like, like it's a dog eat dog, dog eat dog world and there's a $75 spots you get in hundred dollar spots and people are like mm -hmm. going at each other over them and i was like i got a writing job in la it paid more and then i was like the job lasted like say a month the show got canceled right but after it got canceled i was like i think if i stay here i can get more writing jobs okay. you know i just felt that way and i, I was like riding in a car with Hugh Moore, who you just mentioned. Oh, funny work. Okay, and, small and, uh, he was playing Mob Deep. And they, they said, scared money don't make money. And, that's, and I've heard that song so many times, and that's the first time I heard that line. Like, like the way I listen to music, I listen to beats, mm -hmm. 
and I listen to the words like they're a part of the beat. I don't like mm-hmm. listen to like individual. I, I don't memorize like lyrics and shit like that. That's I don't even have that capability for some reason. But and I heard that and I was like, oh shit, because the show got canceled, but they gave me a payout because it ended before the contract did. Mm-hmm. So I had the most money I ever had in my life, and I could come back to New York. I already had an apartment in Jersey City, and then go back to the grind of doing spots in the city and colleges and bouncing from there to there and just, or I could get an apartment with no job and see if I can spend the money that I have to make more money. Gotcha. And I just chose to do that, stay in LA. Invest in yourself. Yeah, invest, yeah. Right, which, which well, fast forward, we have limited time. Mm-hmm. Um, so now this year, is this your first special at Comedy Central? Yeah, first special, First yeah. hour long, Bill Burr Presents, mm-hmm. Ian Edwards. Right. Um, seems like there'd be a plethora use a big word of uh-huh. writing opportunities now why why make a special right. now as uh-huh. opposed to just locking in on you know being a showrunner or or being on staff someplace because i want to be pigeonholed i don't want that to be my only option mm-hmm. so if i start doing a bunch of specials now nobody will ever forget that i'm a writer mm-hmm. and I, I have some i'm not making as much now from doing stand-up as being a writer but I can get to that place. Right. And then I'll have two options. And when I get to that, I'm like, oh, do I want to do this now or that now? And I can do both of them just as easy as I can do the other. Mm-hmm. So I just want to just have present myself and create more options for myself instead of like, he's a writer, he's a writer. You know, it's, it's tough to even get some of these gigs because people are like, oh, he's a writer. So I have to like mm-hmm. make it clear that I, this is what I'm doing right now. Right. Well, clearly, t- coming to Philly is capitalizing off of the stand-up this year. Right, right. But, I mean, I'm also, like, we literally just finished uh, last week. Marlon Wayans was here to talk to him. And, oh, right. And, um, you know, he's he's worked for, I mean, his show Marlon just got, oh, it's two years and that's done. Mm-hmm. I know you worked on Carmichael's show. Right. You know, it seems like there's, it, go, it goes in waves. I mean, our... Are the opportunities as vast as we see them, or is it is it changing in terms of like the unions and different things? Like how secure is breaking into writing right now? If you were talking to a young writer right now, what what lanes or what avenues would you give them? It, it depends. Like I think there's more writing opportunities. When I when I first started writing, there were like four or five channels: mm-hmm. NBC, ABC, CBS. Fox, so maybe four, maybe I'm missing one. Right. And then now it is, there's shows, original shows on YouTube, there's shows on Hulu, there's shows on Amazon, there's shows on Netflix, mm-hmm. and there's new platforms that are being formulated right now. Mm-hmm. So you can get paid, it, there's, there, there's more opportunities, and especially if you're ethnic, like white people are feeling really guilty right now mm-hmm. and they are hiring more ethnic people uh, and just just because they should and also they don't want to look like they they're racist mm-hmm. so that helps so there's more opportunities and and some white people might feel that mm-hmm. they're losing jobs but they're not losing jobs either because there are just more jobs period yeah, so it's you growing know? exponentially so it's, just grow- and it's, so it's, it's just helping everybody you know, there's more platforms. There's another one about to be formed called Quibi. That's about to drop. And then I think ABC, uh, Disney mm-hmm. is going to have their own platform. This is mm-hmm. going to be so many. This is just a, a lot Com- of opportunity. For, for on the low end, yeah. budget-wise, comedy and family run the whole thing. You know, like in the- theatrical, it seems like superheroes, big budget tent poles are the right. thing. But if you're funny... It doesn't cost a lot to get get in in the game. I don't, I don't know if I don't know if that that could be true or not. Maybe, I'm maybe just saying not. there's just more there's just opportunities, more opportunities because it's more platforms. Well, I'm saying it pays to be funny. That's my yeah, point. Yeah. yeah, it helps. Yeah, it helps. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wait. The, okay. So for those who are looking to, you know, they're they're doing the they want to 
write pilots, right. work on a staff. Um, what? How does that traditionally work when you're in the writing writers room, and then you're? How do you get a job? How do you get a job? How do you pitch your episode, and then how how do episodes generally get written? Because you you got to deliver them very quickly. Well, I, those are three meaty questions. Yes. So let me just say how to get a job. Okay. First, and then we'll see if we get to the rest of them. Of course. To get a job, it's different now. Back in the day, to get a job, you might have to have an agent, right? And you have to, like, say you want to write on a talk show. You have to have, like, a talk show packet. Like, either one that was given to you for a specific show, or you just have a bunch of late-night monologue jokes written, and uh, also uh, desk piece ideas or just sketches. Mm -hmm. to get on a show and your agent would submit them to a show that's looking for writers and some now if you're just somewhere in the middle of the country just it out of the way if you're writing sketches and putting them on youtube or just anywhere if your twitter account is lit mm -hmm. you know what i mean and you have like a, a bunch of followers and it's popular you'll get calls from agents to be like hey we like what you're doing have you ever considered coming to LA can we meet you you, you, you can we sign you and then they'll get you jobs from there so there's mm -hmm. there's still the old way where you have to like like write a spec and then try to get an agent with it and then try to get meetings to get on a show with it you know and, and have them submit it to some of the networks or you could just have something going on online that's popping and right, the like business the, will business is out there fishing uh, online they're looking for people yeah so like the eastbound and down it's always sunny in philadelphia those were regional people that um were discovered viral through their viral sensations yeah 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 you, you know. can go viral in a good way right so so once you're in the room how do you keep the job uh you just do your job if you, you know you just your job is to contribute to the show and uh, it's just a conversation. It's just like if people are talking about sports, you you know, you contribute to the conversation. Like it's like a barbershop. It's just be loose, be yourself and be funny mm -hmm. and contribute and talk and let other people talk, listen and react and give and take and just be just trust yourself mm -hmm. and you'll be fine. Yeah. So, so basically, if it's a sitcom, so the showrunner has a, a, a graph of, of how the season's going to go, basically. Yeah. You, you, you he has a graph, you or you out. guys can make it together, and you just, it's just all about ideas. What ideas do you have to contribute to, these, to this idea? Your idea could change the trajectory of the season. It could add to the, tra to the trajectory of the season. Right. It could uh, just help out in increments. It just... Mm -hmm. You just be present, right. be yourself, and pitch ideas. And then the whole room, you know, they you break stories. For a sitcom, they break stories. Like, right. we have to come up with 20-something episodes. So, you know, uh, we'll do a, let's see if we can have an idea about beating your kids. That was an example mm. for a blackish. And then they went around the room, asked everybody if their parents hit them. Half the room put up their hands, half didn't. Then people started saying why, and some people said why it was beneficial. And then we, everybody started pouring in ideas until they formed a story outline for the episode, and then they gave it to one writer to go off to go write it. Right, so then they'll hand that to you, and then yeah, you, you pretty much have the outline there. And the outline, there's some jokes in there, and you know, pretty much the plot. Right. And you go write it, and then you come back, everybody reads it, then everybody adds more ideas or say oh maybe this thing this this thing that we told you to put in there didn't work take that out and put this in there instead mm -hmm. then you go off and do a rewrite and also the network chimes into right. then there's a table read and after the table read they judge it on if one table read that people didn't really get to rehearse right. like if everything worked at the table and mm -hmm. then based on the table read you have to there's more notes and you're making another adjustment All right so it becomes a grind but it seems it seems like you're so low key uh, in terms of your energy that like it seems like some people are going to be acting out the characters and 
there has there's no room for feelings when you're trying to nail a story together, right? So, I mean, how how do you how do you work that politically? Like, if you're black, or if you're so, so on a, a white show, or if you're soft spoken, or you're a woman, I mean, do, is it all gloves are off? No feelings are hurt, or it takes a certain what amount you, of sensitivity. I feel like you're asking me like two different questions. Fair you're enough. You're saying like soft spoken, like what does soft spoken have to do with? How does a soft spoken person uh, I, get just, along in the room? Yes, you just it's fun. It's just about being funny and timing. Like you just said earlier, you've done interviews in this room: with Patrice, mm -hmm. Keith Robinson, and Kevin Hart. Yes. And so imagine Patrice, Keith Robinson, Kevin Hart, Bill Burr, Jim Norton, and uh, let's, uh, let's, I, I'll forget. The funniest uh, of the funniest. The funniest funniest at the Comedy Cellar, sitting at a table, including me, uh -huh. all cracking jokes on each other. Godfrey's loud, just right. everybody. And I'm getting my jokes in. Gotcha. You know? You, like, so that's the training for it. You, yeah, you just know how to talk in a conversation. One time on Chelsea Lately... I don't, I, that guy would never book me for Chelsea lately because he thought I was too soft-spoken. And it's like, okay. you, you've, you haven't seen the verbal animals I've been around. <laughs> and I had to get my word in, you know. Like, got you. A timing is, like, you see some shows and sometimes the, the most laid-back, soft-spoken person is the funniest person on the show. He come in, says their line, leaves. Come in, says their line, and everybody's like, damn, we want more of that guy. Right. It's just, there's, there's a way you know and that's that's where you learn to trust yourself and not act out of your you know you, you you're gonna make mistakes but you you, they, you that's what you're there is to figure it out it's like uh you ever watch double dutch when the mm -hmm. two ropes are going at the same time like mm -hmm. and some person gets in between them without even getting touched and right. and starts skipping it's just how it is. Right. So if you, you can do that with rope, you can definitely do that in a conversation. Right. And you, yeah. you know your lane at this point. Yeah. So that being said, I mean, um, I mean, I'm loving, the, I'm loving the talk. I know you're about to go back on. Uh -huh. um, so so I, I don't know if we answered all the questions, but just to hit you uh -huh. with um, two more. I know today, as we record this, mm -hmm. this is crazy. I don't, I don't see a lot of politics in your joke, but as we speak this. Uh, Trump tweeted something and the Dow Jones dropped 500 points. That's a lot of power. <laughs> um, you know, it's, a, it's 2020 is right on the horizon. Uh -huh. uh, are you thinking, are you hearing, there's a lot of candidates, are you thinking, hearing any thoughts about what's, what's up next in this uh, society? What's up next in this society? I'm leaving it wide like, open you for you. Well, I'm just saying 2020 is coming. Elections on the, on the verge. Uh, a lot of things are in the in the process of change what do you do you have any comment on the political realm uh i mean yeah but it's just I, you know there's so much you could say mm -hmm. I j you just want the best candidate mm -hmm. yeah you just want the best candidate and right now i don't know who that is because i made a vow like two years ago to stop watching the news because the news only gives me the impression that everything is wrong even though there's so many things right or else the world would have sunken already if we go by the news so i made a concerted effort to stop watching the news mm -hmm. so i really don't know what's going on and you know what my life has only changed for the better because there's less depressing shit that i have to fend off when i go to sleep at night you know what i mean it's like mm -hmm. like i only know the good things and i, and I guess because of social media you do hear about other things so that's i do right. hear about most things right but this is like the nba right season right now there's so many teams i'm not going to start watching politics until the playoffs i understand you know what i mean until it gets down to the nitty-gritty yeah i think it's a little too early but i yeah. figure since we're, we're here we ask about that yeah. and then on uh, relationship advice that's seen it's you're a single man uh -huh. single vegan android owner yeah mm -hmm. um any words out there for the men or women who are either dating or in a relationship that, yeah. that would be of help. Yeah, a relationship. It like I, I had a, my, my last relationship ended like early last year, but I realized, and this is just my advice, that you, you know what a relationship is for. A relationship is to make you better. You know, it's to make you better, and a relationship is to force you to be honest. Excuse me. A relationship is to force you to be honest. 
And uh, so then sometimes you're in a relationship, you don't want to say certain things because you don't want to piss the person off. And also sometimes you shouldn't say some things because you sh- because y- you're saying it out of fear. And a relationship should make you examine yourself and make you become a better person. So that if you don't like something and something is wrong, or it doesn't even have to be something wrong. Like if there's something you know you like that your partner doesn't like or won't like about you, then tell them instead of holding it in because then at some point it's going to come out and the relationship's going to end anyway. So and you'd be surprised what people, I'll be like, fuck it, I, I'm like that too. So it's just like instead of like suppressing shit, you know what I mean, and not being, you know, take it's if you're an honest person a relationship is a great place for you to test how honest you are and then also it's like if you lose someone because you're honest and if they leave because you're honest then that person was never meant for you anyway it wouldn't have worked in the first place so you might as well just be as open as possible and then you'll be free to find a person that will accept who you really are well, we love it. We love you, Ian. All right. And uh, I would encourage anybody, everybody watching. Mm-hmm. And you have a lot of lot of podcast fans. I saw some Joe Rogan shirts out there. Oh, right. um, a lot of a lot of people know you through mm-hmm. these new mediums. Oh yeah, for sure. But where can people find you, and support you, and pay to see you in the way, the best way possible? All right. I got a website, Ian Edwards Comedian dot com. I A N E-D-W-A-R-D-S, comedian.com, and my uh, show dates are there. And also, follow me on Instagram. I'm on Instagram the most, at Ian Edwards Comic, at Ian Edwards Comic. Mike touched my lip. But that's where you can get at me the most. Yeah. Okay. And I'll put all my dates there. Just follow me. Just have some fun pretty much it fair enough we, yeah. we didn't, I hope hopefully somebody laughed mm-hmm. that's something besides my shirt <laughs> um, <laughs> it is snug it's snug this is very snug yeah thank you so much right. man peace brother appreciate you thank you I'm Ian Edwards and you're watching Real Black